So if you are doing any simulation, one of the things that is most used part of your program is the random number generation. Yesterday, somebody was talking about how to improve, how to make that analysis faster. And with another faculty member from some other department. And then somebody mentioned, well, you know, somebody made their simulation and their analysis 10 times faster, not by going to parallel processing, but just looking at the random number generation. Because for every iteration that you're doing, you're probably using hundreds of random numbers. You're calling this little routine many, many times. And that not only can make the simulation faster, but it also can make the simulation bad and good. So the, random num the goodness of the random number generation can change the results. All right. So with that, let's look in detail as to how the random number generators are done. You probably will never write a random number generator yourself in your life. However, it is important to know how it is done because then you can use them correctly. Okay. And so we are going to teach you how random number generation is done so that you can put the seeds right and you can use it right. Because without that, you will see as we will go through this chapter, lots of people make very common mistakes and get results that are unbelievable. Okay. So we'll talk about desired properties of a good generator, LCZ is the what is most commonly used, linear congruential generators. Tausworthy is another one. And then we will give you a survey of many random number generators, how to select the seed, and then something which are, which are myths about the random number generation. Again, let's redefine the random number. Random number is, all we are doing is uniform number between zero and one. Random variate is another chapter in which we talk about, talk about how to do normal and you know exponential and so on and so forth. Here we are talking about simply uniform 0, 1. And um, so that would be random variate would be coming later, but here this whole chapter is about random number. And here is a very simple random number generator. Xn the nth number is equal to 5 times the previous number plus 1 mod 16. Okay. So you start with, let's say, any number you can start with. Let's say you start with x0 is equal to 5. Put 5 times 5, 25, plus 1, 26, mod 16 is 10. So the x0 is 5, x1 is 10. Now you put 10 here, and you get 5 times 10. 50 plus 1, that will give you x2 is equal to mod 16. So it will give you x2 equal to 3. And so you get 10, 3, and then you put 3, you will get a 0, 1, 16, so on and so forth. And this is the sequence you will get. All right? You can divide all the numbers by 16 and then you get this sequence. These numbers are uniformly distributed between 0 and 1. OK? And if you did not know the formula, they look random. Right? If you know the formula, then you can figure out what the next number would be. If I told you, oh, my number is 0, then you will, if you know the formula, you can tell the next number, right? So that's why they are called pseudo-random, half-random, because they pass the randomness test, but if you know the secret, then they don't. <laughs> right? But it's not that much of a secret, by the way. The, when you use your random number generation, you will publish it. Or anybody's random number generator you use, you will know their formula. So this is not for secrecy anything. There is no secrecy here. All you want to do is you want to do it most. So for secrecy, you need different kind of generators. <coughs> and those are not covered in this class. Those are covered in the class called network security. All right. In this class, we just cover these generators which are required for simulations. And secrecy is not the issue. 
random message the issue. Yeah. How it is normal? Uniform, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's another chapter. <laughs> so we have several chapters in this simulation thing, and there is a chapter on testing random number generators. There is a chapter on variant. So there are many other chapters. So this is the most important of all the chapters. I thought first I will cover this. Once we are beyond this, then we see what to do next. All right. So there are tests for randomness. And some of them we will do here itself, some simple ones. But anyway, what you have learned in the previous example is several things. First of all, the very first number that you selected is called the seed. You have to supply that number. Okay. And in our case, um, we took the seed of 0 0.625 and then we gave it to the routine. The routine gave us 0 0.1875. Okay. And then it, it continues by itself. You gave five, so five upon sixteen by your seed. Oh, because everything is. But the thing is, in the example when I started this, I told you the formula. I, I told you that we do mod sixteen and then we divide by sixteen to get zero one. Otherwise, the numbers will be between zero and sixteen. Actually, zero and fifteen to be exact. Right. And you are not interested in 0 to 16, you are interested in 0 to 1. So you divide everything here by, by 16 in this example. If I change everything actually in this equation, huh? In this equation itself, I can write. Yes, the thing is, it is difficult to do this in the real arithmetic. This is an integer arithmetic. This is very important. If you do it in the real, then you will lose the randomness <laughs> because you will lose some bits at the end. We don't want to lose any bits here. So this is done with infinite pre precision. <laughs> okay. Real arithmetic has a precision, right? 32 bit, 16 bit. Here we are doing integer arithmetic. Okay. All right. So pseudo random, deterministic yet would pass the randomness test. Fully random would not be repeatable. The problem we don't use fully random number generators is because if every time you did this thing, a different number came out, then you cannot show that simulation to anybody. You show the simulation, a whole different result comes out. And you don't want that to happen. You want them to have the same result, you know, unless you want to change it. The thing is you want to repeat. Sometimes you want to do five repetitions. In that case, you want five different results. That should be in your control. But given the same seed, you should get the same result. You can change the seed, you get a different result. So this is fully, so we don't use fully random stuff. And there are two other things. Cycle length and the tail period. Basically, if you start this random number generator, it will go like this. It will go to some value and then it will come back to some value again and then it will just circulate around. So this is called the tail and this is called the cycle. Okay. And in this example, if you notice, we started with 10, we ended up with 10 here. And then we ended up with 10 again and so on and so forth with 5 and all that, right? So what is the tail length? Here the tail length is 0. Right? And the cycle is? Go ahead. Well, I mean, sitting here, you know, let's just start with the 5. If you start with 5, you will get 10 and then you will come back to 5. So that... 5 is a part of the cycle. Right? And um, and the cycle length here is either 15 or 16. Let's count. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. Okay? So in this case, the cycle length is 16. 
All right. So what is a good generator? To begin, it should be efficiently computable. We are going to do millions of these things in your simulation, right? So you really don't want it to be very complicated formula. You don't want to have exponentiation, division, and anything like that, right? I mean, division is there, but that division by 16 is not really a division. Right? Periods should be large. You don't want them to be repeating every tenth number, same number coming back. And the successive values should be independent and uniformly distributed. Now, here's the interesting thing. We want them to be independent. How can they be independent? You're taking one number and computing other number. They are dependent, right? But statistically, they will pass the independence test, most of them. Actually, first, by the way, there is no independence test. But they will, when you try to do the correlation, is very, very low. And so that's why they are independent. And then there should be a new form. That means between 0 and 1, and every value is likely. So then there are four kinds of generators. <coughs> the most common kinds are called LCGs, linear congruential generators. And there are three other kinds, which we'll talk about later. But LCG is the one that I showed you a minute ago. And it was discovered first times published in 1951. And what he observed was that the residuals of successive powers of a number have good randomness properties. So he observed that if you take any number A, and make it a raised to 1, a raised to 2, a raised to 3, a raised to 4, and then you divide by some m and take the remainder. Then he found those remainders look like have very good randomness property. So writing this, that xn is equal to a raised to n mod m is same as writing that xn is equal to a times xn minus 1 mod m. Yeah. So three, they already showed you, right? And then we'll tell you more. But the three are, just remember these three. Efficient, large period, and uniformly distributed. And independent, right? So these are two different things you can test. You can test how much is the correlation. If you have two random number generators, one has a correlation of 0 0.01, and one has a correlation of 0 0.001, you know which one is better, right? And uniformly distributed, there are tests for uniform, just like your, there is a test for QQ plot, you know, for the, normally you can do QQ plot for uniform, right? And see, you know, which one is closest to the line. Yeah. Cycle is actually the period. Okay, so let's just define it again. The period is this. Yeah, but the tails generally are, you know, not that much, actually. They are, like, in our example, it was zero, and that's not very uncommon. So, yes, I mean, you, you, if, you have a, if, you have a, if you have a generator where the tail is very large and the cycle is very small, that would be really bad. <laughs> because once you reach that point, then you are repeating. So, yes, so the your observation is correct. That if I were given a choice, I would rather have a large cycle than, than the, you know, large tail. But generally, the period has to be much, much bigger than what we need. So suppose we need a million number, we have to have period 10 million. So we are not going to reuse any number again. All right? And so these things have to be very large. All right, in this, A is called the multiplier and M is called the modulus. Yeah. The addition. Yeah, yeah, so this is a special case. It turns out this was discovered first and then somebody said that let's add something. So, Lemmer choices were that, that, and he probably worked for um, IBM, I don't know, in those days, which was the biggest computer company, or, I mean, wherever, but anyway, 
So he tries out that you use a equal to 23 and m is equal to 10 raised to 8 plus 1. You see, the reason he selected m is equal to 10 raised to 8 plus 1 is because division by 10 raised to 8 plus 1 was very easy in that computer that he was working on. And it was probably a decimal computer, not a binary computer. Okay. And so this was his choice. And this was good for a this, this machine in Yak. I, so this was, I think, it's Pennsylvania somewhere. I forget where this machine was. This is 1951, right? right? So, so, so this is one of the early machines, and it was a decimal machine. And then somebody said, no, no, better thing is to just add a B. All right. And actually, on the top of that, they said M should be binary in the sense that you know power of two rather than power of 10. So this was analyzed quite a bit. And now it means that it can be easily gen easily analyzed. And this is called mixed congruential generator or LCG. The reason it is called mixed is because there is addition and multiplication. If there is no addition, then it's called multiplicative LCG. This is a mixed LCG because because we have addition and multiplication, and it is LCG because we are doing this linear congruential stuff, this mod stuff. And so, so basically, this is what is most general form. By the way, Knuth, all of you have heard of him, Knuth or Knuth, whatever you want to call him, he has a whole volume on this analysis of LCGs. So, this is one of the favorite pastime for mathematicians in those days. <laughs> and statisticians, you know, for, for example. Okay. So A, B, and N affect the period in autocorrelation. What is A, B, and N? A was the multiplier, B was the adding, add, the, the increment, whatever you want to add, and N was the modulus, right? So A and, and B can affect the, this choice has to be very carefully done. M should be large. The period can never be more than M. So that is one thing. That your M should, if M is small like 16, your period cannot be more than 16. Right? So M has to be large. And um, for, mod, for M computation to be efficient, M should be a power of 2. So that you can do mod, mod M. If you have to do mod 2 raised to 32, it's very easy. You just shift by that many bits. All right. Then the next result is if B is non-zero, the maximum possible period is obtained if and only if. So this is necessary and sufficient conditions coming up. If and only if. Integer M and B are relatively prime. What does relatively prime mean? They have no common factor. Common factor is only one. Maximum else what they call LCG list. L um, Least common denominator, is it? A least, least common multiple LCM. Um, I think that is the other side. I, I mean the other way, you know, which is probably the maximum factor, whatever that is, you know. Eh? <laughs> whatever, right? Yeah, that is one. And then every prime number that is a factor of M is also a factor of A minus 1. All right. Integer M is a multiple of 4. If integer m is a multiple of 4, then a minus should be a multiple of 4. So there are how many conditions so far we have set? We have set three conditions, which is easy actually to remember. A, m and b should be relatively prime, and every prime factor of m should be a factor of a minus 1. And if m is a multiple of 4, then a minus 1 should be a multiple of 4. Those are three conditions. And notice that all these conditions are of met if m is equal to 2 raised to k. A is equal to 4C plus 1, and B is odd. So if those things you do, M is equal to 2 raised to K, take any value of K, 2 raised to 15, 16, 32, 64. A minus 1 is a multiple of 4. A minus 1 should be a multiple of 4. That means A should be 4C plus 1 some for some value of C. And B should be odd. That means there is no common. If B is odd, then M and B will have no common factor. 
because m is 2 raised to k and b is odd. So it's very easy to satisfy those three conditions. And um, so most of the uh, random number generators that we will see would be similar to this, like this one is an example. Xn is equal to 2 raised to 34 plus 1, Xn minus 1 plus 1 mod 2 raised to 35. So this is, this satisfies all those conditions. You see this is 4C plus 1. And this is odd. C. Oh, that is what I'm coming up. Basically, so the thing is, um, so here four C plus one. You are saying C is two raised to thirty-two. Why did somebody select four two raised to thirty-two for C? Yeah, there is another example here. Somebody else selected two raised to eighteen plus one, and so here two raised to sixteen is C. Right. So before you do, before I answer a question, let's just go over and then we'll come back later. Okay. So lower autocorrelation between success number of preference. So now what you want to do is if you take these two, they will have the same full period because they both satisfy this condition. Those are necessary and sufficient, if and only if. So their period would be M. So both of them will have period what? 2 raised 35. All right. However, these are different generators, they have different statistical property, even though they have the same period, the first one has a correlation of 0 0.25. Would you like a generator which has a correlation of 0 0.25 between successive number 25 percent percent, they are not very independent, right? And the second one has a correlation of less than 2 raised to minus 18, that's the one we want. Right. So, just for the starters, not all full period generators are equally good. Yeah. Yeah. So, the conditions are not for independence. What the conditions are for? The conditions are for they are just for the period. They are not saying that that means it is a good generator. It means that one of the things for the good generators. Yeah. Oh, how do you find correlation? Oh, that's very easy. All you have to do is take a number the minus mean x minus x n minus mean times x n minus one times mean. Add up correlation between any two numbers you can any two sequences you can find like that, right? So that will give you the correlation between the successive numbers. You can also find the correlation between numbers which are one apart, so xn and xn minus 2, you can also find the correlation between xn and xn minus 3. There are lots of correlation you can find out, but I think the generally the if the correlation between with, with previous one is very large, then you reject right there. If the previous one is 10 to minus 18, then you go and see well what is with the next to previous one, which is xn and xn minus 2. Right, so you got to do lots of analysis before you can see whether it is a good generator or not. All right, so now you know what the LCGs look like, and these are real LCGs which you might use in your computers. And um, so, a special case is multiplicative one. In multiplicative one, B is zero, and the formula is this. And in this case, there are two different cases. One is that m is a power of 2 and then m is not a power of 2. If m is a power of 2, then the maximum possible period for a multiplicative LCG is 2 raised to k minus 2. All right. Now, here's the thing. We are stating lots of facts without proof. And I'm not going to do proof because that is mathematicians' pastime. I mean, you know, that's basically, you know, you have to read Knut. Okay, and we are really going to just use these things, these facts, rather than prove them because just knowing them is is a big, big win. 
So if you have 2 raised to k, then the maximum you can get is 2 raised to k minus 2 for a multiplicative one. For a mixed one, you can get total 2 raised to k. But for a multiplicative one, you get 2 raised to k minus 2. And this period is achieved if multiplied a is of the form 8i plus minus 3. All right. That 4c plus 1 has gone. Now here we are saying that a is of the form 8i plus minus 3. And here is interesting. If the initial seed is odd, so if you select the wrong seed, you won't get this period. All right. So the condition for getting this 2 raised to k minus 2 is that you have to have i, which the designer would have taken care of it. But the user has to be careful too. The user has to select an odd seed. And it might be a good generator, you know, because one fourth may be not bad. I mean, one fourth of two raised to 35 is two raised to 33. Who cares? Right? That's big enough. So, so multiplicatives can be used. There are some problems. Other problems are that the low order bits are, are cyclic. And this is another thing to know. And that's why I'm teaching all this is if you take a random number, the whole number is random, not the bits. If you just take one bit, let's say you want to flip a coin, you may say, well, I will take the last bit and see whether it is odd or even, right? That will give you totally non-random sequence. Okay? So we will we will actually show you actual example later on. So that's what we are saying. The, the low order bits, low order bits are not random. They have a cyclic pattern. All right, so let's look at this example. Xn is equal to 5 times Xn minus 1 mod 2 raised to 5. Obviously, this is not the generator that you will ever use, but this is the generator that you can easily analyze on your laptop, right? So this is a twice generator. And if you use the seed of 1, you get 5, 25, 29, 30, and you get a 5 here. Your period is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, which is good because it is 2 raised to 5 divided by 4. 32 by 4. So you have a period of 8. Right? As we said. And this one, by the way, is 8i plus minus 3. So this is 8 times 1 minus 3. Okay? So that's why this is the maximum period. And the maximum period is 2 raised to 3. And if you use x equal to 1, but if you use x0 is equal to 2, then the sequence is 10, 18, 26, 2 again. So the period is 4. That's not a good seed. Okay, yeah. You mean in this one? Yeah, the, all it is saying is that the A has to be like this, either 5 or 11 or 13 or 16 plus 3 is 19. I just come in teaser, yeah, you just, you know, so it has to be, so that the A is like that. In this case, 5. So, uh, i equal to 1. I could have taken i equal to 0 and then gotten 3. Yeah. For, for this one, yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I'm saying, okay, no, no, no. 8 is not large. But for 2 raised to 5, that is the maximum you can get. You will not use 2 raised to 5. What will be using here? 2 raised to 35. Well, I mean, some big number you will be using. In that case, this would be, you know, one-fourth of that big number, and it's good.
Okay. All right. Now, if the multiplier is not 8i plus minus 3, let's say 7, which is not this form, then if you put x0 is equal to 1, you get 7, 17, 1. Again, the period is not full period. Alright, if the multiplier is not 2 raised to k, then there are some other properties people have figured out and I will explain you those properties. If the period is not 2 raised to k, then if it is a prime number, if it is a prime number, then with some value of a, you can get period of m minus 1, which is really large. I mean, if you take very large prime number, m and you use that then you can get a period m minus 1. The maximum possible period is m but I mean like this is if you are taking m is a prime number then you know this is how you get it. If and only if a is a primitive root of m. So this is the condition which is necessary and sufficient that a has to be primitive root of m. Now, for us engineers, what is the primitive root, <laughs> right? So, the primitive root is defined as follows. A is a primitive root of m if and only if a raised to n mod n is not equal to 1 until you get to m minus 1. So, I will show you an example that will make it clear. Basically, so let's take the example. First of all, let's take the generator. The generator is a is equal to x is equal to 3 raised to x n minus 1 mod 31. So here, 31 by the way is a prime number. Right? If we select the proper a, then we might be able to get a period of 30. Right? So let's try 3. We try 3 and start with 1. We go all the way here. And you get one here, which I think looks like 31 numbers there. Okay? So, this is good. Period is 30. Sorry, period is 30, not 31. 30, because 31 is the M. So, if you, if, if this happens, then you know that the 3 is a primitive root of 1. So, this is like a circular definition. How do you find that something is a primitive root? You just generate a random numbers. And if you get that same number after m minus 1, then it is a primitive root. <laughs> if you get it before, then it is not a primitive root. All right? You can try something else. For example, you can try 5. Put 5 there and take any value, a starting point, and you will see that this will not happen. For 31, people have done it for all numbers. And they found out that 3, 11, 12, 13, 17, 21, and 22, and 24 are primitive roots. So, if I basically have to write a program that just does it, this basically x raised to n. Say, let's see, one prior 17 is a primitive root. It will do 17, 17 is square, 17 cube, 17, you know, so, so on and so forth. And then figure out if you get seven, whatever you started with back. Now, the interesting part in this one is that all this mathematics is very easy to do on a computer because there are no overflows because you, if you keep doing the mod every time. So, when you do 17 square, don't take that big number. 17 square divided by 31 to get a number which is less than 31. Then, when do I get a cube? Multiply that number by 17. You get a bigger number, bring it down to below 31. See? If you bring it down to below 31 every time, you will get the correct answer and you can continue forever without overflow. So, don't just write a simple program which says 17 raised to 300 and then your computer says, sorry, <laughs> here's a blue screen. Right? So, as long, so basically, if you did this, then you will find out these are the primitive roots. All right. Now, so 
we actually have said almost everything that has to be said about LCGs. We have seen three different kinds of LCGs. We saw mixed, we saw multiplicative. For multiplicative, we saw 2 raised to k and not 2 raised to k. Right? And we know what are the conditions for mixed. We know what are the conditions for 2 raised to k. We know what are the conditions for not 2 raised to k. All right? So all those things are given to us and we just have to know, I mean, we just need to know them, right? Now the question is, we have to implement it. You want to do it, because these are large numbers, by the way. For 17 or 22 or 31, I said that every time you multiply, you bring it down to below 31. But for numbers which are 2 raised to 31, these are still big numbers. And still you could get into overflow on a 32-bit machine. All right? So somebody figured out how to do this calculation where, the, you know, so that there is no overflow. Again, this is simple mathematics, but the formula is here, and you need to know the existence of this. So if you were to ever write it, you go back, open the book, and implement the formula. Okay? And the formula is as follows. First of all, you cannot do this in real arithmetic. So you cannot do it in basic. Basic has no real, no integers. Everything is real. All right? So you have to find a language which has integers, which most languages do. And you cannot, and you have to make sure that none of the calculations results in anything which is more than the largest integer in your machine. Right? So there is no overflow. And so here is the thing, ax mod m, if you want to multiply x by a and want to take mod m, then it is equal to g of x plus m times s of x. Okay? Where g of x is x a times x mod q minus r times x div q. Now, that is, let me explain what these notations mean. Mod is remainder. And div is quotient. Everybody understands what is div? When you divide x by q, whatever you get the division result, that is the quotient and that is the x div q. What you get in the bottom is the remainder and that is called x mod q. Right? So if you have the mod part and you have the division part, then this thing applies. Similarly for h, x div q minus a x div m applies. And so what you do is you calculate q is equal to m div a and r is equal to m mod a. And then basically you can calculate. And so I'm just going to show you an implementation. Actually, this is a this is the whole code given here. So you can get the code, but basically I'm going to give an example. So let's say you want to calculate this, you want to implement this random number generator. Right? So this is a prime number. So this is a multiplicative generator of the kind. What kind? This is the multiplicative generator of the kind which is modulus is not 2 raised to k. Right? And 7 and this number. 16807 is one of its primitive roots. Somebody wrote a program, figured out how many primitive roots are there, and this is one of those 534 million primitive roots. <laughs> all right, so this is a good all right. Now, we, all we want to do right now is to implement this thing. But the problem is if you implement this without thinking, then you take a number which is close to this and multiply by this number 16,000, it will overflow your machine. Right? You have a 32-bit machine. This one is 30, less than 32-bit. This one is less than 32-bit. This one is less than 32-bit. But the product of these two is more than 32-bits. All right? So you can't do that. So what you do is you say A is equal to this, M is equal to this, so Q is equal to M div A. M divided by A. You get this number. 
this is the division is not exact and division is not i mean basically full in the sense that this is the what you get the quotient and this is what you get as the remainder right so the quotient is q and the remainder is r all right now for a collect implementation now here is thing the test for you if you do it right in whatever language you select you should get x 10000 equal to this number All right. So let's see first the implementation. The first thing you do is you figure out a and m, which is given to you. Then you figure out q and r. Right. Then you have these four integers that you calculate. X div q, x mod q, x nu is this formula. If x nu is greater than zero, then x is equal to x nu. If x nu is negative, then you add m to it. And x is equal to mod x nu m. Okay, when you add m, this can you know this is so mod m, and um, and you keep doing this basically. So this one is while x nu is less than zero, x nu is equal to x nu plus m. So keep doing this, uh, and as as long as it is more than m, you bring it down to m. Anyway, so at the end, whatever you get, you divide by m, and you get the random number. Everybody understand the pseudo code, right? So this is the method. that will implement a generator without overflow and then you will get the correct generator then you will get yeah, and you can check it out because i did program and i figured out that this is the 10000 number and um, for other generators you know, whoever implements it will have to figure it out okay and um, if you wanted to use the real arithmetic then you will use double and then you will do actually truncation which basically gets it in integer and you can get it like this so i put it on excel worksheet and you can put it on excel worksheet too you put the parameter a n q and then excel can calculate r and um, sorry you put a and m the excel can calculate q and r And then you can put zero, one, two, three, four, five, all the way to twenty thousand to ten thousand to a million rows, and it will do the calculations for you. If you program that method there, you can do it in Excel, and you can see whether ten thousand comes out that number. Okay. All right. So here is for you to do that ten thousand times. <laughs> you have to implement this generator using a seed of 1 and you have to determine 20000 so basically 1 10 100 1000 10000 and 20000 all right by the way percentage sign is used in excel for div right and um, and then you multiply that um, sorry what is it saying it's saying that the uh, r times x by q is not equal to r times x by q because this multiplication will be done first so so basically you have to put the parentheses at the right places if you want to do whatever you want to do all right so that is the homework any question about the homework yeah you use what Okay, the reason I want you to do Excel is because many languages will give you the answer right there. Okay, if you use a proper language like I used to use Simula, I don't have to write any code. I just give it the generator and <laughs> implement it for me. So, Excel actually requires you to program the division, multiplication, addition, and second thing is we can check it out. If you use something else, I got to learn that language first. <laughs> we got to learn that language first, and so. it becomes difficult to check it out so right now we are limiting it to excel you know and um, and then you know when you are in the real life you can do whatever you want basically i just want you to know the basics here obviously you will probably be not implementing a random number generator in excel you will probably here thing you know excel has random number generator and you will probably be using that generator 
you know, in the real world. But here we just want you to know that how to implement this. All right, now here's another thing too. Um, one more thing, like um, I wanted to say, when you present the results, please don't give us 2,000 pages. <laughs> because 60 lines per page for 200,000, you know how many lines there are. So what you have to do is you have to hide. Everybody knows how to hide the rows. Hide everything other than these numbers. So we can just see those numbers. You do have to program 20,000 though. I mean, like you have to just take one thing and say copy. And as far as you can go down. I like to start all over again, copy. As far as you can go down. Generally, rather than one by one, you could do, you know, thousand at a time. <laughs> okay. All right, so now you will know how to implement a random number generator, which is a big win. But these numbers that we generated so far, are they are not long enough for cryptographic applications. For cryptographic applications, which means for network security, we need random number generators, which are 512 bits long, not 32 bit long. So far, we were talking about 32-bit machines and how to use the numbers below 32-bit. But what if you need, actually, 10, 512 would be very small. If so, what if you need 2,048-bit um, number? OK? And uh, that's the kind of numbers we need. For cryptographic case, OK? For our simulations, you don't need it. So then there is this guy. And he, algorithm, he generated this one. His thing is he does it in binary. And the nth bit is given by a function of the previous n minus, previous qubits. So you start with n minus 1, multiply it by some coefficient, an exclusive r with cq minus 2, bn minus 2, exclusive r, blah, blah, blah. So this is like a regression on the previous values, but the instead of addition, we have exclusive R's, and everything here is binary. So C's are 0 or 1, and B's are 0 or 1. OK? And this is um, exclusive R, which is marked to addition, by the way. So you use the last Q bit, and you get the next bit, and then you use those Q bits, and then get the next bit, and so on and so forth. This is also called autoregressive sequence of order Q because we take the same thing and we regress it. Basically, we, we are, I mean, we are not actually fitting a regression here, but we are given the regression and we are forecasting. Okay. And this generator, again, we are not proving, but we are giving you a fact, can have a maximum period of 2 raised to Q minus 1. If you take the last two bits, the period would be how much? Three. Two raised to Q is two raised to two minus one. If you take three bits, it will be seven and so on and so forth. Good. All right. So. Let's take an, uh, let's, let's take, um, before, I mean, basically, before we go to the example, the, the way to express these things is to use a delay operator. And so X and B, I minus B, when you apply a delay operator to something, it goes up by that. So for example, if you apply it to B, N, it becomes B, N plus one. This is just a notation. Okay? So instead of adding Bn plus 1, we can write D times and D applied to Bn minus 1, Bn. All right? If we apply D Q times to Bi minus Q, we 
basically the, I'm, what I'm doing here is I'm rewriting this formula here, bn equal to this, and I'm going to write everything in terms of bn minus q. So dn is, I should have used n here, dn is dq bn minus q, right? This is dq minus 1, cq minus 1, d raised to q minus 1, bn minus q, and so on and so forth. All right. If I take out this common term, which is bi minus q, which is basically take out, then we get and bring it to one side. We get that dq minus cq raised and so on and so forth equal to zero. This polynomial is called the characteristic polynomial. By the way, this polynomial has only binary coefficients. All right. So this is a characteristic polynomial. And instead of D, if you write an X, then it is called characteristic polynomial. So basically, the characteristic polynomial for this generator is X cubed plus, 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 and so on and so forth. By the way, minus and plus are same. Why? Yeah, mod 2, whether you add or subtract, the same thing. So I have changed these minuses to pluses here without even saying anything. So basically, that, that is the polynomial. Now, the period of the smallest positive integer n for which x raised to m minus 1 is divisible by this characteristic polynomial. So, you take this polynomial and you divide into x raised to n minus 1. Whatever is the, so whichever value of n, the smallest value of n will be perfect multiple of this is the period. Now, we'll see an example in the clearer to find the period. So, maximum possible period for order q is 2 raised to q minus 1. And that polynomial is called primitive polynomial. So just like we had a primitive root, now we have a primitive polynomial. And we will see examples of each of those. Here's a polynomial. x raised to 7 plus x raised to 3 plus 1. x raised to 7 plus x raised to 3 plus 1. Right, time to go? OK, so here I think basically take your paper. Maybe I can stop it here, at least seven minutes, but maybe I, I, I should finish something. But anyway, so take your paper, make sure you take your paper. Um, so hey, here's the polynomial. Um, So this can be written as d raised to 7 bn plus d raised to 3 bn plus bn equal to 0 mod 2. That means bn plus 7 is plus bn plus 3 bn equal to 0. Or we can write down that bn plus 7 equal to So this is the polynomial. Basically, bn is equal to bn minus 4 plus bn minus 7. Yeah. 0 mod 2. Yeah, yeah, right, right, right. Basically, we want to make sure that the whole arithmetic here, this mod 2 applies to everything here, that both sides are done mod 2. Right? And so, when if I give you this polynomial, you should know that the generator is this one. Okay, everybody can get from there to here. All right. So now we can start with the seed. The seed is b0 equal to b1 equal to b6 equal to 1, all ones. That is our seed. This is the number seed number is 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 6 ones. We put those ones and get b7 is equal to b3 and b0. We get this, b8, b9, b10, b11. So we get the next six numbers are these. Then we, and we can continue. Actually, we are not doing six bit at a time. We are doing one bit at a time. But I am just writing here six bit at a time so that you can see them clearly. So you get all this whole sequence. And you will notice that the sequence starts repeating here. This is six ones, six ones. Huh? OK, seven. Yeah. 
right? Seven. We start with seven ones. B zero to B six. Start with seven ones, and we ended up with seven ones. And so the period can be calculated. Period is one twenty seven, which is two raised to seven minus one. And therefore, this is a primitive polynomial. 